friends, welcome back. George here once more at Killer Hearts with an exciting video full of musical magic, I hope at least. Isn't making music fun? I think it is. I can read your minds as well. You're thinking, yes, it is. You, you're so right, George. I agree. I'm glad we're on the same page because this is all about making music, this video. This is all about how I made this month's track. I've made another track based on this month's sale called Exploring Space. Uh, last month it was Cybergrime, this month Exploring Space. And if you're quick, in the next 24 hours or so, you can still get 50% off uh, Reverb, Haas, Ensemble and Filter. Uh, four tools for making space in your mix, for exploring the various dimensions of space. We talked a couple of weeks ago in a video about three dimensions of space, up and down in frequency content, left and right in pan value, and that kind of depth value in and out of the screen of volume, but also of ambience and reverb and wash and all of that sort of stuff. So we're going to talk about all of that kind of thing in relation to this song. Uh, and we're going to have a great time doing it. I should apologise in advance that this video is going to be very lightly edited and uh, hopefully not too long and rambly. I will try and be concise, but uh, you'll find out next week why this week has been a particularly busy one here in Kilohertz land. There's exciting stuff afoot. So uh, subscribe to the channel and you will find out all about that very, very soon. Uh, there's a big subscribe button below the video. Don't forget to go and click it. Uh, and without much further ado, let's get on with the video and talk about five things that I think went well in this mix, five kind of tips for how to make space in your mixes, but also, and I think this is way more interesting, five mistakes I made or five things that kind of went wrong that I wouldn't recommend are a good thing to make space in your mix. So no one's perfect. And as I keep saying, I'm not really here to teach you anything. I'm not some kind of guru, uh, except by teaching you with my own mistakes. So let's talk a bit about them in the second half of this video. But to begin with, five good things. Let's start off with the positive. And particularly, let's start off by setting the mood, listening to a bit of this track. If you want to, there's a link to the full track in the description. Go check it out, enjoy it, listen to it, add it to your playlists and whatnot. But um, let's just set the mood for this video by listening to a pre-chorus and a chorus, getting a feel for the song. I'll see you in your dreams So as you can hear, a bunch of different kinds of ambience and depths and spaces in this song. The chorus obviously very deep and rich and heavy reverb, lots and lots of space. The uh, verse is much drier and tighter and uh, I've tried to make sure that there's a lot of variety and interesting stuff going on in terms of space in this track. Uh, so what is going on and how are we achieving it? Well, let's start with tip number one, which is to use a ton of filters everywhere all the time and uh, make sure that you're not overlooking the value of filters in your sounds. So let's take for example this sound which I call cook fire. It's a sort of growly buildy sound into the chorus uh, which sounds uh, like this. And as you can see using four filters in the uh, faceplant uh, generators section here. The two in the middle particularly are just kind of adding character with their peaks creating little overloads and distortions as they move but the uh, top and bottom ones here, the high and low pass filters, are doing the job of cutting out, sculpting out a space in the mix for this sound. Without them engaged the sound is a lot more kind of uh, flat and flabby. Let's listen to it. with these filters engaged, really tightens up. And I've applied the same principle to a bunch of different sounds in this mix. I think the riser into the chorus is another great example where uh, you have a lot of the character of the sound coming from the filter used in the faceplant patch. So this bandpass filter here is rising 
with the pitch of the riser and that is actually doing at least as much as the pitch to build hype but it's also really carving out a little niche for this sound in the mix so that it moves perceptibly in your uh, sense of space. Without it, obviously, there's all sorts of noise coming through that shouldn't. But the far more important use of that filter is to carve out a little space that this sound can occupy. And of course, that space moves upwards and upwards, creating the hype. It contributes a lot to the effectiveness of that sound. Um, so use a lot of filters. That's tip number one. I think they're a much overlooked tool to uh, add uh, interest and a sense of tightness of space in your mix. So don't forget filters. Tip number two is to record lots of different sounds, um, ambient sounds, real sounds, if you can, at different distances from a microphone and indeed in different spaces, if you can. So um, I'm working from home, as a lot of you are, and I've got a weird little room that I used to my advantage in this track by recording a bunch of weird percussion in it. Um, and sitting different sounds at different distances from the microphone allowed me to create a completely natural sense of ambience and space with all of these different sounds bouncing around. And without much processing at all, or even any processing, the listener will perceive those sounds as coming from different distances. And if you're recording in stereo, of course, different directions. So let's listen to some of them. Those cowbells much further away than, for example, this balloon, which is really just, I was rubbing a balloon really close to the microphone. And there are a bunch of different sounds in this mix that are, uh, and this is a double-edged sword, by the way. We're gonna talk about why this wasn't perhaps such a good idea later on, but um, for now, let's focus on the positives of this. It is an interesting way to generate a sense of space in your mix without the use of lots of processing. So this one you can have for free. All kinds of different ambiences coming out of different areas. I think I've added a little bit of reverb, for example, to that triplet drum as well there. But um, you can start with your ambient sound in your room and uh, make the most of that. Uh, particularly by recording percussion. I really like to do that. Adds sort of a layer of hype and excitement and uh, texture to any track. Uh, but you must be careful, and we'll come back to why a little later on. Um, tip number four, though. Uh, oh, no, tip number three is what we're on, isn't it? Tip number three. Let's talk about tip number three, which is use different types of reverbs uh, and use them sparingly. So once you've recorded your real life ambience, as it were, with percussion or um, different backing vocals set back from the mic in different uh, degrees, you can then go about using your uh, plugins to create some artificial ambience. And that obviously is a great fun thing to do, especially if you're recording lots of synths in phase plant like I am. Uh, so let's take, for example, this super saw in the chorus, which I thought it would be fun to use a really odd reverb on. <laughs> If I pause, you'll hear an extremely unusual ambience dying out into the distance there. And that's in this instance of Snap Heap here. Uh, it's a filtered, uh, slightly pitch shifted reverb, but none of that is the key here. The key is that there's a long decay reverb going into a really heavy distortion, nasty quantized distortion, full drive, but at a very low mix level. So what that's doing is it's creating that crazy dystopian uh, crackling into the background as the, the reverb dies away. Um, and it's also obviously sort of, sort of sustaining the volume of that reverb as it dies away and creating this weird sense that the ambience is melting and crumbling into a kind of strange digital distance that uh, shouldn't be there. It's a kind of uh, color reverb, if you like. Um, and in fact, I mean, maybe it's a good moment to mention that <laughs> reverb isn't the only way to create this kind of ambience. I've used uh, in the chorus on this bass sound uh, a bit crusher to achieve something of the same effect. It's uh, adding uh, depth and texture to a sound without actually adding any reverb at all.
Without it, it's a pretty dull sound. I mean, it's, you know, nice and fat and all that, but... I've treated that basically as a, a reverb effect or an ambience effect there. It's uh, creating a... <laughs> there's that super sore reverb again. Um, it's creating a sort of uh, a depth that really shouldn't be there. And uh, I've done that on one moment in the vocals as well. Let me find that because it's a similar thing. It's not actually uh, reverb at all. Where is it? It's about here, I think. It tells me, oh, it's just your vision of you. And there is that uh, bit crusher again. Oh, it's just your vision of you. And I've panned it from left to right through the course of that phrase to create the sense of a decaying reverb tail, a moving little uh, background. And uh, so all of these creative ways to create ambience in the track shouldn't be shied away from. They're nice little details that you can add just to make things uh, a little bit more creative and exciting, but you must use them sparingly. For example, uh, leading into the chorus on that main hook of the song, Out Exploring Space, um, I've added a particularly uh, interesting reverb, which is mega big and deep, but I've used uh, automation to make sure that it only applies basically to the word space. Fun only be for me while you're out exploring space. And in the context of the mix, that sounds like this. So that word space has a huge degree of ambience attached, but then the second vocal track comes back in relatively dry and uh, resituates the vocal up in your face. So that single word space opens up like crazy and that's creative reverb in action, but use it very sparingly or everything will get very washy very quickly. And you don't want that. You want to be careful with this stuff. Uh, otherwise you can make mistakes and we'll talk about them a little later. Am I teasing it enough? I think I am. Um, so let's move on to uh, tip number four, which is don't be afraid to dry out. Um, I tried to make sure that there was a ton of contrast in terms of the use of space and ambience in this mix. And in order to do that, I've taken um, a pretty aggressive approach to drying out the sound in certain places. So the um, middle eight is perhaps uh, the best example. Be the best that you can be, even if it's not for me. And obviously the vocal is very much drier there. It's got a lot less reverb on it. Uh, but also I've got this uh, ukulele and bass sort of uh, combo going on here, which I think adds a little bit of something. It's a very dry setup though, uh, and very close therefore to the listener. It's very much kind of in your face. <laughs> Almost no reverb, if any, on those. And uh, again, that's just for contrast, really. As much as anything, that's to make sure that uh, in the chorus there's an even bigger impact from that really deep ambience. So don't be afraid to dry things out and uh, use your contrast to your advantage. That's tip number four. And tip number five, think in mono. Now, obviously, using stereo width to create space in your mix is uh, an easy option. It's, a, it's the most obvious, in many ways, option for uh, spacing your sounds out and making sure that they don't cross over one another. You just put one of them left, one of them right, one of them down the middle. Um, I'm actually a big fan of uh, LCR panning, left, center, right panning, uh, in certain contexts. In, for example, a uh, really rough and ready rock mix that can make sure that the right things are sitting out to the sides and creating width while the kind of key stuff is absolutely straight down the middle. Um, and it keeps it all organized and tight and neat. And so that can be a great way to work with it with extreme panning only. Um, but in a mix this complex with so many different sounds and so many different little details uh, creating space and occupying little pockets of space in the mix, I think 
if you took panning as your main uh, avenue for finding that space, you'd run out very quickly of options because ultimately the perception of the stereo image in your mix is pretty limited uh, and you'll just want to push things wider and wider and wider using uh, for example, our uh, stereo plugin, which um, maybe I could demo on that cook fire sound that we listened to earlier on. Um, if you wanted to, you could take the following approach and uh, add stereo to the end of your uh, sound. Okay. Uh, let me solo that up. Where is it? You could take the mids out. really widen your sounds and create an incredibly wide mix but then the whole thing will inevitably collapse when you uh, end up in the real world where almost everything collapses into mono uh, unless you're sitting right between hi-fi speakers or listening on headphones in a good space um, most of what people perceive of course is mono and so actually I've ended up using uh, very little stereo width in this mix uh, in the individual sounds themselves. Even these percussion elements, which are really kind of background uh, ambience elements, they are almost all uh, pan centre, uh, just a few of them slightly right, slightly left. The cowbells, I think, are the most extreme over to the right, but even they are balancing one another. They are not sitting hard right. And um, the reason that that's a good thing in this mix, I think, is that um, it organises the uh, most important elements of each sound into the center so that you can definitely hear them uh, and you can hear what's really important. You can hear the rhythmic articulation, you can hear the uh, melodic uh, features of all of these different sounds. But the reverbs, for example, the ambiences, those ridiculous uh, uh, quantized uh, distortions or those, uh, those uh, uh, chip tuny kind of uh, bit crushed sounds, they can be panned wide and if you lose them in the mix when it collapses into mono because somebody's listening halfway across the kitchen or whatever, you know, that's not the biggest deal in the world, but they are there for the really detailed listener. Um, but uh, so using too much stereo information in a mix, uh, I think is really tempting. But in a mix like this, think in mono and make sure that your, your tracks all sound really tight in the center in mono. So, you know, we've got kick, snare, um, uh, guitars, bass, all up the middle here, even those uh, Telecasters, which have an element of width to them uh, imbued by Ensemble um, in Snap Heap here. Um, they are uh, still focused in the center because I'm using this symmetric motion so that even if you're listening in a terrible environment and things are collapsing on themselves, you will hear that sound right down the middle. <laughs> So tip number five, think in mono. Make sure that the thing is nice and tight in mono and find your pockets of space more in your frequency content and in your depth. And then I think you'll be glad you do when you do finally flip the mix into stereo. You'll uh, really appreciate that there's still a lot of uh, opportunity to exploit in your stereo image. But um, make sure that the crucial forefront elements of your mix are good in mono. And then you'll be on to a winner. Um, but not everything in your mix can be a winning thing, especially if you're uh, pushing yourself and going outside your comfort zone like I've tried to with this mix. And that's a, a good thing to do, of course. If you're not pushing yourself, if you're not making mistakes, you're not learning and you're not, uh, you're not making new, exciting things for yourself. So I now want to go on to talk about five things I'm not so pleased with in this mix, five things that kind of went wrong or that proved difficult or that were just flat out not very good in the end. Uh, and uh, a bit of an honesty corner. Um, you can all comment and tell me that you agree with me. Let's get let's get really serious and say um, whether you agree with these five mistakes I'm about to uh, outlay and um, what you might have done differently. Because uh, I think that in any mix, there will be things that you want to be critical of. And I've got five things here, uh, beginning with the obvious. It's wildly overcomplicated. And I kind of did that on purpose, of course. I thought, you know, exploring space is the prompt or whatever. And what a fun thing to put tons and tons and tons of different sounds and details into a track and try and find a space for each one of them. Um, but in reality, I think if I was gonna um, mix this track for any other purpose than uh, this, you know, product demo and this uh, tech demo of, of, of trying to manipulate space in the mix, 
I think I'd probably lose 60% of the nonsense in here, although it's dead entertaining. All this percussion, right, and I said we'd come back to it, um, while it adds layers and layers of interest and, and coolness, um, it's really tough to keep this tight and neat and make sure that it all sits uh, just at the right very distant distance from the listener and doesn't come too close or uh, catch the ear in an unsatisfying way. Uh, for example, over here, if we're um, listening with everything else in the mix, I hope I've managed to sit everything in a comfortable position, but things will still poke out depending on your system, depending on who's listening and uh, where you're listening. For me, those those mints, I've got like a little tin of mints I'm shaking here, and they're really popping out. And then there's that sound, which just actually flat out isn't that attractive. You know, but it's all colour and it's all interest, but you just, as soon as you add layers and layers of this uh, colour, you start to make it difficult for yourself to tighten things up and make it sit and occupy uh, a, a reasonable space in the mix. Same goes for um, compositional ideas, right? It's not even just about too many sounds, but too many ideas in a mix can be detrimental. Um, I had this idea compositionally of um, a, a rhythmic sort of tension between uh, straight quavers and triplets, and particularly in the hi-hat here, you hear it. Let me see if I can... Uh, uh, make it nice and clear for you. It's just really quiet, so let me bring in the um, kick there and maybe just the percussion. Uh, and So that's just giving you a shuffle. Two, three, four, one and two and three and four and one and a two and a three and a four and a. And like when you break it down, it's okay, but as soon as you try and fit that in amongst everything else, it actually probably ultimately contributes to just making the thing a bit messy. Um, I've got all these green bits in the percussion are uh, elements that are kind of compatible with that triplet thing. So I've got um, the best place probably is here. I've got a drum in straights and I've got a drum in triplets. And you know it's all well and good and it's fine and it's fun but you've got to be really careful how you manage and integrate these ideas or they don't contribute to making the sound cooler they just contribute to making it messier. I wonder who is it? There's always someone so, you know, you be the judge of whether you think that works or not, whether it's properly enough integrated. I think this little chiplets sound in triplets is neat. But, you know, that's the only moment that I think it's really properly integrated because the triplets become as prominent as the duplets just for a moment. But anyhow, um, that's a little uh, mistake that I feel I made here. And if I was really making this for the purpose of making the best track possible, I'd probably delete a lot of this stuff or, you know, silence a lot of this stuff. Um, as it is, I'm just making it for all kinds of fun and to demo lots of wacky stuff on uh, <laughs> ambience and space. So I'll give myself a pass on that and I uh, hope you will too, but I hope it hasn't ruined the track for you. Um, so mistake number two, um, and this is a small thing, but it's a, an interesting little detail, I think. Um, making space for every different sound, obviously, is the name of the game with this, but the more you work to make pockets of space for your sounds, the more danger you're in of creating gaps in your sound as well. And I'm particularly talking about frequency ranges here. Um, and the best example is the snare in the chorus, which sounds like this. And that's a interesting sound that is almost nothing like a real snare drum, of course, but um, made this in Faceplant. I was really pleased with it. I thought it was distinctive and unusual. And also I was delighted that it was 
almost all quite high frequency content so that in the mix it wasn't competing too much with the bass stuff. So the best thing you can do, pray I'm still here for you. But what you need to so that snare drum's pretty distinct in its own little area, right? But I showed this track in uh, an earlier stage of completion to some friends and they pretty much unanimously agreed that there was something missing in the chorus and that snare was not occupying the kind of area that they expected it to. And we added in the end this, uh, it's a couple of samples I think, which just fill out the low end of that snare and make a big difference to how it sits in the mix. Let's hear it without and then with. The best thing you can do, pray I'm still here for you. But what you need to and as I say, it's not a massive deal, it's not a huge problem, but I did I was kind of worried that that would compete for space with the bass. Um, but in fact, in my hard efforts to make it not compete, I opened up this weird pocket of unfilled space. Uh, in between the snare and the lower frequency elements in the mix. So... Again, if we're talking about integration of carefully uh, codified little elements, uh, that's an important little filler to uh, fix the gap between two frequency specified elements. So be careful when you're making pockets, you're going to make some that aren't filled, you're going to make some little gaps. So that's something that I learned making this mix. Um, mistake number three uh, is a question really of taste I guess, but I wondered whether some of these drier sections that I throwed it, threw in for extreme contrast were a little bit too dry in the end. So particularly the middle eight here. <laughs> Actually, let's listen just coming out of the chorus, which is very wet and ambient. And, you know, as I said earlier on, I did this completely on purpose. I wanted a very dry sound with um, much more kind of in-your-faceness, and particularly the vocals. I've taken almost all the reverb away. Uh, those... Uh, rhythmic ukulele bass parts are all uh, really tight and up in the face and dried out so that they uh, occupy a space that isn't being occupied in the chorus, i.e. right up close to the listener's face. But um, I wonder whether I've gone a little bit too far with it. And again, tell me in the comments whether you think so. Um, the vocals, obviously the melody is pretty exposed at this point and I've taken away all the reverb that kind of supports the melody and although Noel's doing a great job here, my pal Noel who's done a, a wonderful job with all of these vocals, although she's doing a great job, I think as a mix engineer I've not helped her vocal by exposing it to this degree. Best for you, honestly, be the best that you can be, even if it's not for me. So I guess the point here is like in your pursuit of contrast and uh, extreme exploration of varieties of space in your mix, don't go too far. Don't cross the line and make stuff uh, too dry or I suppose too wet. I've talked about, you know, overdoing it with the reverb and making stuff too washy. That's a kind of an obvious mistake to make, but you can make the opposite mistake and end up with a sound that's just kind of lo-fi and amateurish and underproduced. So... Um, I think making sure not to overextend is important. I, I kind of feel like I'm happy with this the way that it is, but it's a thing to be careful of and it can really turn into a, a mistake, I think. So um, what do you think? Leave a comment down below. Uh, and while you do that, I'll move on to mistake number four, uh, which is this sound here. Now, this sound is not a mistake in and of itself. I think it's quite a cool sound. There's this resonator patch, which again, I'm, I promise I'm going to talk about in a future video in Faceplant. Um, but uh, it's a, a sample of some noise like raindrops, or I think it's actually a campfire uh, crackling away. And it's going through a resonator. It sort of sounds like a 
twinkling, um, dribbling kind of sound. And it's a really cool sound. And I, I have Aravain to thank for this, the author of our Tremor content bank. I spoke to him about this track uh, at the end of last month and uh, he sent a sample of his over that was similar in sound to this. And I used it as a kind of inspiration for this track. It's all very interesting stuff. And on its own, it's a cool noise. But in the context of the mix, again, um, making sure that it occupies space was wildly difficult. And um, I think depending again on what sort of a system you're listening on, it can be a little bit grating. And the trouble with it is, it's the best thing about this sound in isolation is that it's got massive dynamic range. So the, the peaks are really quite loud and twinkly, but the body of the sound is very low in volume. And I like the sound so much that the song opens with it on its own in isolation before the kind of bass kicks in and all that. And so, you know, when I realized the dynamic range was a bit of a problem and it was sticking out unpleasantly, I thought, well, okay, just turn it down then. But then that intro is incredibly quiet, like, have I even started the track quiet? So I thought, okay, well, I'll turn it down just at the moment that everything else comes in. But then, weirdly enough, um, let me see if I can actually replicate that now. Um, it created a really weird problem where uh, the ambience of the track, the sort of atmosphere, changed wildly uh, at the moment when the other instruments came in. Let's automate it, in fact. So if we take that moment and drop the volume there, it comes out like this. And it's like, well, it's still there, but where's that interesting ambience gone? And this whole thing is about making space and creating uh, interesting ambiences for the song to live in. And dropping it completely felt really weird. Uh, fading it out completely felt weird as well because it it sort of it was there one minute and it wasn't and it was like the whole feel of the song changed um so obviously i thought well compress it then but compressing it took away as i say the best thing about it which was the extreme uh dynamic range of it it just ended up sounding like a really weird nasty cheap pad so any which way around it was really unruly and difficult to deal with and so I suppose the the moral of the story here very rambly long way around to saying it but the um the sound here is really interesting because of its dynamic range and dynamic range is that in and out of the screen dimension of uh space and um having things close and far away a sound like this has both and so it's a great uh sort of sound effect it's a great uh, sense of space and ambience for the track but actually in the context of the track it's really difficult to balance so um, again I you know I've done my best to sit it at an appropriate volume throughout but uh, I think it's the kind of sound that would need very careful management in any mix and a sound that you couldn't use more than one of um, this kind of uh, wide dynamic range sound is is kind of going to stand alone in a track if it's going to be there at all so um, my point there, I guess, is the, the mistake is uh, <laughs> choosing a sound that, while it's cool on its own, is unbelievably difficult to sit into the mix. And I suppose that's true of a lot of these percussion sounds as well, and it speaks to the same sort of uh, overcomplication issue that I mentioned in uh, mistake number one. But um, choosing sounds that are uh, awesome on their own only creates the problem that you have to work that much harder to fit them into a space. It's like having a really... Um, individualistic creative kid in your class at school and trying to uh, get them to focus on something uh, that is uh, that is helpful for them is a tough thing because they want to just go in every direction and fill the space and do everything all at once so um, that's a little philosophical thought for you on the uh, topic of uh, overcomplicated and sounds in the mix that uh, take up too much space on their own finding the right way to limit them can be difficult um, Finally, mistake number five um, that I've made on this track, and this is really kind of a, um, a definitely a matter of taste and uh, 
uh, what you feel about things. But the final mistake, quote unquote, is to never forget composition. And I should say, like, I'm quite glad with the way this song turned out, but I think one of the weakest things about it is actually the songwriting. And I was so obsessed all through the process of making this track with all the production value of making these different spaces and finding interesting ways to use reverb to demo for you folks and like, you know, all this gated reverb stuff on the toms that we talked about and that weird distorted reverb on the super saw, you know. I was so wrapped up in that element of the issue that I didn't spend much time or energy making sure that I absolutely loved the song. And this is a totally like non-salesy point here now because of course Kilo Hearts is all about giving you tools to do interesting things in terms of production. And there are no tools in the Faceplant uh, catalogue that are uh, centred around songwriting, although hopefully all of them are useful in the context of songwriting. But um, I think it bears saying uh, at every point in every mix that however cool your tools are and however well you're using them, um, the end product is only going to be as good as the song that you put in. And so while I think this song is pretty cool and it's got like a, it's got a strong hook that is quite memorable and it's got a lot of interesting production elements, um, I'm not feeling like it's my favourite song I've ever worked on, purely because compositionally it's not quite as adventurous and as creative as I'd like it to be. I don't think the melody and the harmony go very far, there's no sort of journey to them and um, I think even though the uh, hook is strong it's not particularly uh, original or uh, unusual. I think if I, again, if I spent another month working on this song, um, first of all I'd delete half of the, um, <laughs> the production like I said, but I'd also want to make a lot of time for um, rethinking and uh, uh, re-sculpting the composition, perhaps adding uh, another chord into the verse structure to change the kind of uh, the musical colour of the song uh, in a moment, rather than uh, just relying on all these different production techniques to colour the song. I would want to use musical techniques to colour the song as well. So perhaps um, I'm going through this nice sort of progression in the uh, verse through um, a sort of major and minor uh, mode here. So it goes with a sort of F minor uh, to B flat minor and then B flat major and an F minor seven. So that's, you know, the sort of James Bond chord progression. That's all very nice, but maybe I'd throw in some sort of unusual modal sound, like a little A, a flat major chord to just make things uh, definitely different. And what would that sound like? Let me get my keyboard going. Um, so I'd have uh, this thing. But then I might go seven. Ooh, nice. I don't know, you'd want to take it just to different spaces. And composition, I think, is the first and most important way that you want to do that. So uh, that's my fifth and final quote unquote mistake that I made in this mix, was just to not remember throughout that the song is paramount. And that's the thing I'd like to leave you all with. Uh, I will finish this video now, I promise. <laughs> and the thought that I want to leave you with is have an amazing time making wacky sounds, using space in your mix, do all of this fun stuff that I've tried my best to do well in this mix and avoid all the pitfalls. But crucially, above all else, make sure that you're absolutely psyched about the song in and of itself. Because like, I'm, I'm pleased with this song. It feels like a sort of six out of 10 for me. It's really quite all right, but I, I reckon I could have made it that much more brilliant right before, uh, when I was writing, before I started mucking around with all this crazy uh, production stuff, just by giving the composition a little bit more thought. So there's tip number 10 of the evening positive and negative tips. Tip number 10 is make sure that you're focusing on your composition and really loving the music that you're making because all the fun sounds in the world don't make up for mediocre music. So 
Maybe that's just me. I don't know. What do you think? Leave a comment below and let me know. And uh, I'll look forward to talking to you all again very, very soon. It's been a delight and a pleasure. And thank you for sticking with me despite the uh, lack of production values this week. As I say, you'll find out next week why I didn't have time to do a better job of this. <laughs> and, uh, we'll all have a joyful time together. Uh, great. So have a great uh, weekend and enjoy yourselves. Be kind to one another. This is Kill Arts and uh, you are terrific. Thanks a lot. Goodbye.